Hey, welcome back to a new installment of the Wide Right Podcast. Manny Navarro here from The Athletic, joined once again by Carlos Ledo of the MIA All Day Pod. It is Friday night around 8 o'clock, 8.20 actually, here on the eve of the Miami-Louisville game. Hurricanes get the second half of their season started at noon tomorrow on ABC against the Cardinals, who are 4-2, and 2-1 and one in the ACC. Their backs are really against the wall, Carlos, if they're going to uh, get a return trip to Charlotte after making it last year. They've got to win this game against Miami, but the Canes uh, have some work to do themselves. They didn't look great on defense. The last time we saw them at Cal, gave up four plays of 50 yards or more. Uh, even though they're favored to win this game, Carlos, I feel like this might be the toughest test of the second half for the Hurricanes. Yeah, and let's just acknowledge the fact that we're uh, – this is life in our 40s, right? Two, yes. two men, mid-40s, uh, Friday night, 820, and we're doing a podcast. <laughs> <laughs> and honest, quite honestly, we're probably going to pass out right after the podcast. Uh, so yeah, that's that's life now, man. That's that's what we have become. So uh, I think we're we're more up against the wall than Louisville is in terms of our our life where we're heading. Anyway, so yeah, I think listen, this is a it, we pointed out this game. We circled it since before the season even happened and even started that this was going to be the toughest opponent for the most part uh, until, until uh, we we anticipated Florida State would be a tough opponent as well until they, they took a nosedive. But we always felt that Louisville was going to be sort of that hallmark game to really mark the season and see where the Hurricanes are in terms of a benchmark moving forward. You know, I did not anticipate Louisville having two losses coming into this game, but it is what it is. They're still a dangerous team. They're still a very good team. Um, and I think they're very dangerous in areas where the Hurricanes are a little bit weak uh, that we've seen now the last couple of weeks where they've had some issues. So to me, you know, we've talked about it since the season started. I always thought it was going to be a shootout, you know, now more so the way the Hurricanes defense has been playing lately. But uh, it should be a fun one. Let's see what happens. Yeah, we're going to dive into this game a little bit more. Uh, we're going to talk some about the ACC. I've been busy this week, which is why we're, we're late with the show. I know this, is, this show isn't going to have a ton of shelf life, so we're just going to upload it to YouTube. Uh, but we will get to your mailbag questions. We did request those, and you guys sent in some good, uh, some good fodder for us to digest. Uh, right now, if you look at the ESPN scores, uh, Duke is up 17-3. to Woo, the fighting Manny Diaz's. On Florida State in the second quarter with about now, six minutes to go. Uh, here's a question for you, Manny. If Manny Diaz has a chance to run up the score on Mike Norvell, because essentially that's who got him fired. Yeah. Right? Do you think that happens? Do you think Manny throws a 70-burger if he can do it? If he can do it, but his offense simply isn't good enough to do that. So I don't I don't think they're capable of it. But if he can squeeze it a little bit more in the fourth quarter and, and go up a, a bunch of points, then sure. I, I don't see why not. Wow, so Duke up 17-3 already on Florida State. This is it, this is probably the worst Florida State season in my lifetime, right? In yeah, our lifetime. I, I was just talking about this with Kelvin Harris on the uh, on the car ride home. Uh, as bad as Miami has been for the better part of the last 20 years, where they've been very mediocre, uh, they've never gone through a 1-5, 1-6 start. No. Uh, the worst season they've had is five wins. So yeah. even when the chips were down at Miami and things were rough and they were even firing during coaches, even during sanctions, uh, Miami has not been any lower than five wins. Think about that. Yeah. And right now, Florida State is heading to maybe a two win season. Maybe. Yeah, they've got Charleston Southern, which I think I think they can beat the second to last week of the season. But Never what's know. really what's really embarrassing about this is, Carlos, uh, having talked to people on Florida State staff, they thought this was a team that could certainly get back to Charlotte and contend for an ACC championship, uh, you know, knowing that Clemson and Miami were going to be good. They knew that. They knew those would be tough teams for them to face. But I don't think anybody at Florida State foresaw this sort of fall off that's been going on uh, with that program. And so uh, hard times for the Seminoles. We'll get into more ACC conversation, get to your mailbag questions. But let's dive I love, back. I love how you skirt the, 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 the bad stuff for Florida State. You just want to transition out. Because you don't want to talk about how bad the Seminoles are your favorite team. I get it. Exactly. Yeah. I got to protect them as much as I can, Carlos. That's good what segue, we do on the segue. show. That's why, we, that's why we call this podcast Wide Right. Um, anyway, let's get into this game for Miami. Uh, not going to get super deep into it because, like I said, kickoff is, uh, what, 16 Noon? hours from now? 15 hours from now, 15 and a half hours from now. So this is this is going to be dated quickly. But you, you've you thought about this game. What what stands out to you the most? What presses you the most going into this? Um, So for one, I think Louisville's ability to make big plays, I think, is is impressive in the passing game. Um, they also have a stable of backs they, that they can run at Miami. 
to me, it's not just what Louisville can do. I think it's been the deficiency of the Hurricanes in certain areas, specifically in the secondary. And, and you know, even though they've been okay against the run, they haven't been great. They're giving up 4.7 yards of carry. That's like 60th in the country. Uh, Louisville's 11th in the country right now with 6.3 yards per carry. So that's that's concerning. Um, you know, Tyler Shuck, is that how you pronounce it? Yeah, Tyler Shuck. Shuck, Shuck at Trebek. Tyler Shuck at Trebek um, <laughs> is pretty good when he's got a clean pocket. Uh, 10 touchdowns, one pick, 1,100 yards, almost 1,200 yards, 72% almost completion percentage there. So, again, it, it's going to come down to the same thing we've seen over the last couple of weeks. Can the Hurricanes get pressure on the quarterback? Can they get shut down? Can they get in his face? Can they alter his throws, get the ball out, make him get the ball out quicker? Their offensive line is okay. It's not great. They're ranked 41st in power four in terms of their overall line grade at 65.7. And they're giving up 37.2 on uh, 37.2% of their dropbacks. They're giving up pressures, which ranks about 118th in the country. So mm -hmm. they're not great in terms of pass protection, which bodes well for Miami's defensive line. But again, we've seen the last couple of weeks when they don't get to the quarterback and that secondary gets exposed, then we have problems. And I think on both sides of the ball, I think that's going to be the key. Who makes the most explosive plays? Because I think you're going to see a ton. And the other thing we saw last year was, you know, the one game where we felt like Lance Gidry was out schemed was that game against Louisville. You know, they came in and they really had a great plan for him. Braun is a great uh, offensive mind, and he just had his way with Gidry that game. And seeing how things have gone the last couple of weeks, I don't anticipate. I don't see why not, that, why that won't happen again. Um, so it's concerning for us. So I think it's going to be a track for me back and forth and seeing who can who can score the most points. Um, and, and this is clearly the best team Miami has played thus far this season. In terms of PFF grades overall, team grades, Louisville is 33rd in the country, which is the highest grade uh, on the schedule so far for Miami. So it's going to be a test. Let's see what they can do. But I think, to me, the concerning thing is if Louisville can run the football and go play action and use that to go down the field on Miami and expose that secondary, then they're going to get a bunch of big plays. But if the Hurricanes can get to the quarterback and stop that and maybe be a little bit more stout against the run, then I think they should be able to control Louisville's offense. But again, you know, the way Brom schemes things up is is concerning. Yeah, Miami's number one in the ACC in explosive plays, 20-plus plays, uh, 20 of, of – I'm sorry, 50, uh, 53 plays of 20-plus 20, of 20 plus yards or more. Louisville's second uh, with 41 in the ACC. So you're absolutely right, two of the most explosive offenses. The one thing you got to say about Tyler, Tyler Shuck, uh, he's third in the conference in yards per attempt. So uh, they, he is – you know, when he connects, it's usually down the field. 14 touchdowns, three picks. Ja'Cory Brooks uh, is – probably the second best receiver in the league uh, behind Xavier Restrepo, uh, not just in terms of production, but just ability. Uh, so, you know, this is the best of the best going head to head. And to me, it's really going to come down to wrapping up uh, because when Miami struggled against Virginia Tech uh, and they, and they struggled against Cal, it was two different things against Virginia Tech. They weren't wrapping up. They weren't tackling well uh, against Cal. It was blowing coverages. Both of those things have to be eliminated. If they're not, then, Louisville can very much win this game. I've got Miami winning this game uh, by 10 points. I already predicted that in the athletic. Uh, the spread is five. The over-under is 60 and a half points. I think it's going to go over that. Um, what are your thoughts? What's your prediction for the game? Um, you know, I think, like you said, I think the Canes can win by double digits if they do what uh, what they're supposed to do, which is get pressure on the quarterback and create turnovers. And the two losses Louisville's had, obviously, had turnover, is turnover issues, and that's why they lost those games. Um, but if they don't turn Louisville over, they make mistakes on their end, then it could get dicey, it can get hairy, and it's a toss-up at that point. Um, they're playing on the road against a team that's very capable. You don't want to give them life. If you get down like you did against Cal, and uh, if you get behind again like you did against Virginia Tech and make those mistakes, missing tackles, blowing coverages, you could find yourself in a hole that's going to be difficult to come out of because – that team can score with you. That team can run with you. It's not like Cal where they blew their wad in the first half, uh, you know, midway through the third quarter and said, okay, we've got nothing left in terms of our scheme and we can throw at these guys. They've figured everything out. What do we do now? And their offense got went nowhere. This team will continue to come at you and continue to score. They have that kind of ability, not just from their playmakers, but also from their, their coaching staff in terms of their schematics. I think the Canes can win by 10. Um, I'm hoping they'll win by 10. Uh, but if it gets dicey, if it's like the same thing the last couple of weeks, they could be in a situation where they may, may drop one. All right. Uh, the the X factor in this game for me is Isaac Brown. Uh, you look at Cal. What didn't they have? They didn't have a running game against Miami that was consistent yeah. enough. Jaden Knott has been banged up the whole season. Isaac Brown, a freshman from Homestead <laughs> High School, uh, leads all freshmen nationally in rushing yards. He's got over 500 for the season, coming off a 146-yard performance with two touchdowns. He also catches the ball out of the backfield. There's 14 catches uh, for over 90 yards. 
uh, forces, you know, uh, missed tackles, 18 forced missed tackles for the season, seventh in the ACC. Uh, to me, if Miami can make Louisville one-dimensional in this game, they win. Uh, and that's shutting down yeah. Isaac Brown and not allowing him to kill you because that's what's going to open up Brahms' offense. So big game for Kiko Mawinoa, big game for Wesley Besant, big game for uh, Ruben Bain, just being able to blow up things and disrupt things that Louisville wants to do and make them uncomfortable. So I think that's what's going to be the difference in this game. All right, let's talk about – the rest and the other of the thing you gotta watch out for, Go ahead. like I always say, the Willie Burton effect. Don Cheney <laughs> Jr. Watch out for the Willie Burton effect. Yeah, Don uh, Don Cheney Jr. Unfortunately for him, hasn't really been a factor at all since he's he's transferred over there. I know he's been good in the locker room, but in terms of actual uh, performance and play on the field, just has not been uh, uber effective for Louisville. Uh, they've had other guys that are that are much more involved in the offense. I mentioned Isaac Brown. Uh, but I, I think ultimately uh, this is not a game where former Canes, I expect former Canes to come back and haunt them. This is a game where, again, tackling is is, is the number one thing for me. So we'll All see All it what takes happens. is one to two carries and an explosive run, and then uh, Willie Burton's in the house. <laughs> <laughs> That's correct. All right, Carlos. So one of the one of the requests that we got when I asked for for mailbag questions uh, was basically to have a bunch of uh, predictions, wild predictions, see who's right uh, for next week. But I, I look, we we can do that for the Miami Louisville game. Certainly, see who's right. Uh, I said Miami wins by ten. What's your your score? How much are they winning by? I'll go. Uh, they'll win by thirteen. Just to they, be different. They win by thirteen to be different. Okay. Uh, who's the who's the player of the game for Miami? Uh, you mean aside from Cam Ward? Yes. Who besides Cam Ward puts up huge numbers? <laughs> Isaiah Horton. All right. I'm going to say Kiki, Kiko Maui Noah. I think he's going to have two turnovers forced, and uh, my he'll be that'll be the difference in the game. Miami will, will force a couple of turnovers on Louisville, and that'll be the difference uh, in the contest. All right. Uh, let's talk about some of the other games that are going on because there are other games uh, in the ACC for people to watch. Clemson is taking on Virginia. Uh Clemson, we have them number two in our ACC power rankings behind Miami. Uh, Grace Rayner and I do. Uh, they've won. They've basically, since their loss to Georgia, they've crushed the last five teams they've played. Uh, all five of those teams had a losing record, by the way. Beat them by 29.4 uh, points. They're number 10 in the AP poll. K Kate Klubnik has really uh, figured things out for the Tigers. He ranks 14th nationally in passing efficiency. 17 touchdown passes, only two interceptions. The Tigers are also averaging uh, 208.8 yards rushing yards per game. The only nitpick, if I had one for, for Clemson, Carlos, they rank 11th in the ACC in plays of 20 yards or more allowed. So they're, they're still giving up big plays on defense. Uh, and they're 14th in the league in red zone, red zone touchdown percentage on both offense and defense. So when teams get into the red zone, they're scoring touchdowns on them. And when Clemson's getting into the red zone, their touchdown percentage is still lower half of the ACC, bottom bottom fourth, really, of the ACC. So uh, something for you to watch if you're going to tune in at all uh, to the Clemson-Virginia game uh, as you study them. Who are you – I mean, when you – do you tune into other games on Saturdays or are you just watching the games? Do you, are you like – do you have your eye on anybody else in the league? Listen, I've got split screen. I've got YouTube TV. That's what God invented it for, man. I love watching college <laughs> football. Like, I'll sit there and I'll watch whatever. I'll watch uh, East Tennessee against Central Missouri Tech. Like, that's if it's on the TV, I'm watching it. But, yeah, you know, I, I think Louisville, like you said, Club Nick's much improved. Um, Clemson. That, that, that Club Nick and Clemson are much improved. Mm -hmm. I don't know what I just said. You it's said late. Louisville. <laughs> it's late, man. Manny, it's, it's past 8 o'clock on a Friday. I've already had a long week. I don't know what I'm doing out here. I'm, I'm delirious most of the time at this, at this hour. Anyway. So, yeah, to me, I think Clemson has been the team that I've been most impressed with after that Georgia game. Um, seeing what they've been able to do, of course, the competition has been great, but they look like they're primed to be back in the ACC championship game. Um, you know, there's sneaky teams like Georgia Tech can still be a thorn in somebody's side. Syracuse. There's a lot of teams in the ACC that can come up and beat you um, just in one of those games where if you don't have your A game, if you're not playing well. Or if one of their strengths, their biggest strengths, really pairs well against your weakness, that's a bad matchup for you, you can go down. So I always watch what's on in terms of, specifically for the ACC and, and across college football. One thing I'm going to be watching the rest of the second half is SMU. Uh, they're 5-1, yep. and 2-0 oh in league play. Their loss, of course, uh, was to BYU, who's unbeaten. Uh, they're number yeah, 21. A lot of people said, oh, they lost to BYU. They suck. No, but yep. – yeah, Rhett Lashley's team is one to watch. And, and I got to tell you, to, if we're being honest, I don't think their schedule is very tough uh, the rest of the way. I think it's very winnable. So uh, we've talked about it on the show. If Miami loses a regular season game, 
uh, they could be in trouble. That might keep them out of the college football yeah. playoff. I know the SEC keeps beating each other. You know, all those teams in the SEC keep beating each other up. It's a big weekend with Georgia, Texas, and, and Tennessee and Alabama playing each other. But I'm going to read you the rest of Louis, uh, sorry, SMU's schedule here. They're at Stanford, at Duke, home for Pitt, home for Boston College, at Virginia, and then home for Cal. That's their final six games. I don't think there's a team on there. At least there's no team in the power rankings ranked higher than them. But Pittsburgh, I think, is probably the only one. And yeah. that's a home game uh, that I look at and I say, okay, maybe that's that's trouble. Uh, you know, Duke, uh, a road trip to Duke. Duke's winning again tonight against Florida State. They're going to be 6-1 and one after tonight. They're good on uh, defense. They're very, very good on defense. Rhett Lashley against Manny Diaz. That's going to be a fun, fun sort of, uh, uh, you know, matchup from uh, Green Tree that's back in the popcorn. day. The Anglo Bowl. But uh, I think SMU could finish undefeated in the ACC, and I think that's a problem if Miami loses the game. Yeah, it, it's a big problem. And, uh, you know, obviously SMU's schedule is favorable, um, but again, it's conference play, man. You never know what could happen. They could pop up and they could lose to Boston College. They could lose to somebody else. It's never guaranteed. Um, at this point, it's a it's a war week to week. And you even see it in the SEC. You see it, you saw Alabama lose to Vanderbilt. You never know what's going to happen. You saw Miami almost lose to Cal and Virginia Tech. Um, you've got to bring your A game every week. And if you have a little slip up in conference, it'll cost you. Pittsburgh is the other one to watch. Uh, they're 6-0 and this season. First time since Dan Marino was there in 1982. Uh, Pat Narduzzi, uh, Three and nine a year ago, hires Cade Bell to be the offensive coordinator, brings in Eli Holstein from Alabama, and the offense is really, really good. I mean, uh, and they've got this kid, Desmond Reed, a transfer from Western Carolina, 835 yards from scrimmage, eight touchdowns. Uh, just played really, really well through the first six games. If there's an Achilles heel for Pittsburgh, Carlos, uh, it's that their offensive line has been a, li a little leaky in pass protection. Uh, 65 pressures allowed, most in the ACC. We're in the pro football focus, 14 sacks allowed are tied for the fifth most. So uh, I think, uh, you know, that's a team to watch. And then the fifth one, fifth in our power pool is Syracuse, uh, five and one, two and one in the ACC. They did lose to Stanford earlier this year, but Kyle McCord has been great. We've talked about that quite a bit on our podcast. So, uh, you know, again, tune into some of these other ACC teams, watch the race because it's different. It's not about winning the Coastal anymore for Miami, yeah. right? Yeah. You, you got to be one of the best two teams to get a trip to Charlotte. And if you don't get to Charlotte, you're leaving your fate in the hands of the selection committee. And we saw how that worked out for Florida State. Yeah, and they are season. literally, they're, they're that meme you see of the dude behind the tree going like this, waiting for Miami to make a mistake. Just <laughs> can't wait to see. Give me one little thing that I need just to get you out of this playoff. Um, That's right. You know, the other thing is, it's very interesting that the top teams in the ACC and across college football, it's a trend. It's quarterback driven. If you've got mm -hmm. a quarterback that can play that's making a lot of plays for you, you will be a very good team. You know, you've got that at, at, at Pitt. That's what turned them around with Eli Holstein. You've got that with Syracuse, with Kyle McCord. You've got that with Kate Klubick now coming around with Clemson. You've got it with Louisville and Tyler Shuck, Trebek, and um, obviously Miami with Cam Ward. So it's it's really a, a quarterback-driven game now in college football, and if you don't have that top-flight quarterback, you're not going to be very good. Yeah, you're not. Um, all right. You can read the full article on the power rankings at theathletic.com. You can also check out my midseason freshman All-American team, which is why I spent so much time working this week, Carlos, uh, combing through a bunch of rosters, trying to figure out who's really a red shirt or a true freshman and who's a sophomore. And teams don't do a very good job listing that on their uh, on their rosters. Oh, please, please, people, support Manny. He's come down with carpal tunnel. <laughs> and uh, he's he's now like Mr. Magoo. We can barely see thanks to to staring at the screen all day. Yes, yes. Support him and read, read his articles and make it worthwhile. Hey, one other team to watch out for. How about Virginia Tech? Did you see that last night? What they did to uh, yeah. Boston College? Yeah, but it's Boston College, man. Come on. I mean, all right. They're 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 uh, they're kind of a interesting team to watch the rest of the way. Four and three, still only they can be one a spoiler loss. for people. They could certainly be a spoiler, and they get Clemson at home, so maybe they're the spoiler for Clemson. We'll see. Yeah, to sneak SMU into the title game. Maybe, maybe, uh, or to save Miami to get them into the title. Who knows? Let's see what happens. Uh, let's take a look here at the mailbag questions. We'll wrap this one up uh, pretty quickly tonight. Uh, first of all, Nick Strong, KY Kane, 23. He says, wishes you all were coming to town. I'd love to have a couple cold ones with you all. Go Canes. Nick, I don't have a beer with me, but I'm having something cold. Cheers, my friend. Wish I was in Louisville uh, for the game this weekend to have a beer with you. Outside of that, I'm very happy to be home uh, and watching it on television. <laughs> uh, in the comfort of my couch and writing about that and a lot of other stuff that I got to write about for The Athletic. All right. Uh, Sam Knowlton says, uh, we'll all likely listen to this next week after the game. 
It's already happened. So make some wild predictions so we can see how right you were. I read, I read this one earlier. Uh, Carlos, any other wild predictions for tomorrow's game before we move on? Uh, Cam McCormick, three touchdown catches. That's wild. Very wild. Columbus Kane uh, on Twitter. Do you think Gidry plays any zone tomorrow? Any other changes on defense to prevent explosives? I think he's going to have to. I think he's going to have to mix it up. I don't think he can go just straight man against these guys and expect to uh, to, to to patch up that leaky secondary. I think there's going to have to be situations where he mixes in the zone and even play some drop eight where he's got eight guys in coverage and, and drops at an end and mixes things up. He's got to try and confuse Tyler Shuck and try to get make him uh, take what's available to him, throw the ball underneath, and not make big plays down the field like he likes to. Very true. Very true. Um, I, I agree. I think three three five. We might see some of that. Uh, I'd love to, 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 to make to, to make to look a little different. Maybe to throw a, a certain look at them. Maybe that Miami was in last year. Remember, that's what they threw at them last year because they were injured with a bunch of defensive linemen. Maybe you just you throw that out there to confuse them a little. Um, all right. This is from Kill the Red Bird. Uh, Green Tree Kane. Thoughts on UM's new president? Have you all received any updates on the new football operations center? Well, that is appreciate you bringing this up, Green Tree Kane. Um, Joe Echeverria, uh, who was the acting president after uh, Miami had uh, their president resign and go to UCLA, their previous president, uh, was uh, voted today or selected today by the Board of Trustees as the seventh president in UM history, which is, I tweeted this out at the time. Great news for the uh, football team and the athletic program. Uh, somebody asked me immediately, why are you saying that? Uh, well, because Joe Echeverria definitely supports athletics. Uh, and I know uh, that the way he views the world is that the University of Miami athletic program, their medical program, uh, and and the university itself, uh, they, they go hand in hand. They're viewed as, as pillars, uh, and and the football team has to be good. He believes in that, and that's yep. good for the football program that their their school president is going to uh, provide the kind of financial support and backing that you need. Let's not forget, Carlos, we're entering we're entering a very interesting time in college football with the. Uh, with the house versus the NCAA stuff that's been going on and the settlements and all that kind of stuff where players are going to be getting paid. Let's not forget the SEC and the big 10 are going to be at a huge advantage in terms of having dollars come in through TV, TV money, uh, the ACC, big 12 other conferences will not be getting the same kind of money through their TV contracts. So they're not going to be able to, they're going to have to pony up some more extra dough, which is why Clemson and Florida state have been fighting to get out of the league. Uh, so we're all headed towards uh, more money and more money and more money needing to go to athletics. And if you're a UM sports fan, it's good that Joe Echeverria is the guy in charge because he's the guy with the money. Yeah, and he and Rudy Fernandez were instrumental in sort of making this move to get Mario Cristobal here and, and making the mm -hmm. whole change in the football program. So it's it's clear he's he's going to be you know a, a godsend for the for the program long term. Um, you know, Joe, I'm available for whatever you need. Give me a call. Uh, I'm interested, and in, I'll, I'll listen to offers. Um, I will not work for Beer and Wings anymore. That offer has passed. It's going to cost real money now. I, I saw Joe uh, last year. Um, I forget which which stadium we were at. Uh, he saw me in the hallway and Miami had won the game and, uh, he, he said to me, uh, I love this. Just, he is so behind seeing the football team succeed and he really feels it in his bones. He really feels like it's, it's, it's a super important part of what Miami is all about. Uh, and, and they are 1000% behind getting Mario Cristobal everything he needs, to compete on a national championship level. And, and that's what they're about. And it's not a fake thing. You can see it in his eyes when you watch him at the games on the sidelines. Uh, he he really wants to see this thing through. So it's good that your school president feels that way. Um, all right. This is from Ryan, Rice Sammy 43 How big of an impact do you think losing Ryan Rodriguez and Damari Brown has had on the performance of the team? Do any of our close wins look different well look both of those guys I think Damari was more of a frontline guy Ryan Rodriguez certainly was your starting left guard at the beginning of the season I don't know that he would have been throughout the whole year because Matthew McCoy and, and some of the other guys that they're trying to bring along are good players uh, but it hurts it hurts to not have two guys that were penciled in as starters uh, injured for most of the year if not all of it um, I'd be surprised if either one of them come back at this point so uh, I think uh, would it would it affect any of the close wins it's hard to say. I think Damari Brown's impact, if he was fully healthy, uh, probably would have made more of an impact in the secondary. Uh, but he's a guy that I've told you, Carlos, as long as we've been doing this podcast since since last year in the spring, uh, he's didn't have surgery, elected not to have surgery 
got hurt, tweaked, tweaked the injury again. And, uh, you know, to me, for all intent and purposes, now he's probably got to have a procedure done. So uh, it just, you know, it's one of those things that you either take care of it or you don't. Sometimes you, you roll the dice, you want to keep playing, you don't want to sit out. Uh, but uh, it's one of those things where I think it's got to get fixed. He's got to get healthy before he can get back there on the field. Yeah, uh, I think with Ryan Rodriguez, you know, for a long time we thought it was Matthew McCoy that was penciled in there at left guard before the season started, and he came out and started that first game. We were a little, both a little shocked. Um, so for me, I don't think he would have made that much of an impact because it was basically just a coin flip between him and McCoy anyway, the way we were, they were playing at camp. Um, in terms of Demari Brown, I think what would have been great about having him, uh, his, he probably would have slotted to that nickel slot that they're having so much trouble with right now. They've had to move Daryl Porter down there, and he's not playing well there. He's a better outside corner. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, and they're using Diani Hill and other guys, the younger guys. I think that would have helped the secondary. I don't know how much, but it would have been a better secondary with him there. For sure. No question. All right. This is uh, from Jcord57, Jason. I know we all think about this bye week curse, but I think this team is going to come out ready after the last two games. Not blow out Louisville by any means, but a comfortable two-score win. Jason, I agree. I think this is a different Miami. I think Cam Ward makes them different. And frankly, if they have a step back tomorrow and look really, really bad, I'm going to be really disappointed because uh, I'm going to think that they're not past all the issues that they that they should be past as a team. And Frankly, I think the, the the fly, you know, flying out to Cal for three hour, you know, five hour flight out there to play a game on the West Coast, a night game, a long day. I think all of that contributed to them getting off to a slow start and not playing well. I think this is a, a much shorter flight and Louisville is a team that they should have beaten last year and didn't. It was a close game uh, at home. Lost to them. I don't think this Louisville team is better than last year's version. No, I don't think so either. I think last year's version was was slightly better. Um, but again, it's it's just one of those situations where the Hurricanes are going up against a guy that knows how to scheme them up, did scheme mm -hmm. them up. You know, and I think that whole long flight thing, they they it might have played a little bit of a factor, but I think Cal came in with a great plan just like Virginia Tech did and really took advantage of him, punched him in the mouth early on and put him on the ropes. Uh, if Miami can get off to a fast start and at least be competent in that first quarter uh, and, and get that momentum going, I think they should be able to control the game. But it's it's just you know a noon game. Hopefully, is not an excuse. It's too early for them. Uh, you know, Kentucky's on the East Coast. It's not uh, on the on the Eastern Seaboard. It's not uh, it's not going out to California this time. They should be okay. Yeah, you'd hope so. All right, Brent Peterson. Should Miami play more of a shell cover two defense against Louisville? Prevent big plays that have hurt the defense, but forcing more underneath stuff. Seems like with our offense being so good, we need the defense to be a tad less aggressive in giving up big plays. I agree. I think. Uh, look, part of what happened to Cal was they were uh, their defense was on the field for a long time because they hit the big plays. Yeah. Uh, and that's what hurt them. Uh, I think in this game, <clears throat> Louisville is good enough. They're better on offense than Cal to uh, create big plays on their own, whether or not Miami's in the right place or not. I think this game prevent playing a shell cover two defense is probably not the right approach. Uh, not, a not the right approach. I would probably uh you know leaves uh you know sometimes throw some double coverage uh on their best receiver uh over the top especially that not allow him uh to, to get deep on you and, and force the underneath routes but i don't think you need to play prevent the entire game or with everybody on that defense i don't i, I don't think you need to you know be in a, in a shell two to, to stop jacory brooks i just think every now and then you you want to throw some double coverage and and make and mix things up for tighter shuck yeah, I think you mix coverages, right? I think you got to go man and zone, but I think if you're going to go zone, uh, not just cover two, I think you want to go with some cover three, cover four. Try to keep everything in front of you is going to be the key. Don't give up the big play, and of course, make tackles once you, uh, once the receiver makes that catch in front of you. That's going to be the key. You know, don't give up yards after the catch because that's going to yep. be the, the backbreaker. Um, you know, schematically, Cal came out with a great plan and, and you know just got them out of position early on in that game. Uh, you don't want Louisville to do that to you. The other concerning thing is. Louisville is very balanced on offense. So they can run the ball and they can throw the ball uh, a lot better than what they've seen so far this season. You know, you've run up against teams who are kind of one-dimensional. You know, Cal, last week, all they had was a passing game. They really shut down the run game. Um, the Virginia Tech, really, again, they, they were able to do run the ball a lot against Miami and make some big plays in the passing game, but they weren't highly effective, just like USF wasn't. Um, so this is the first game that they're coming into uh, with a team that's highly balanced that can get them both in the run game and the passing game, and it gets explosives in both areas. So they've got to be ready for anything. So they've got to be able to mix it up on defense, I think. David uh, Hernandez has two questions for us. Uh, D Hernan on Twitter, which group needs to have a great game linebackers with their tight ends or DBs with their wide receivers. I think the linebackers need to to play at an elite level. And I think to me, it's stopping the run. I said it yep. before 
I think it's making Louisville more one dimensional, put them in more passing type situations. If, if uh, Jeff Brom is able to run play action, Miami's in trouble. Yep. I agree 100%. I think uh, Kiko Maunoa needs to have his best game of the season. They, they, they have to have that from in this game. He's missed way too many tackles this year. He's got to be the leader out there. All right. And a second question from David. Uh, will the ACC have more playoff bids than the SEC or Big Ten at the end of the season? Uh, the answer to that is no. 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 You see who runs football. Yeah. They're the ones in charge of the money and everything else. Uh, Armando Izaguirre, uh, AY2 Mondo. Predict who has the better stats the last six games for Miami, Martinez or Fletcher? Pick one. I'd go Fletcher. I'm with you. Horton or Brown? Horton. I'm going to go Brown. I'm going to say really? it's a surprise. I'm going to say it's a surprise. I'm going to go okay. a little different than with you. Uh, Barron or Bain? Wow. Oh. I think Bain gets it going. I agree. I think Bain gets it going here the next uh, few weeks. All right. Vitamin D Saunders in 3D says no excuse for coverage bust in the Miami secondary. But to be honest, the D line hasn't been getting home. Also crossing routes or long drag routes across the field are man to man beaters. The secondary has to switch or, or pass off. Our DC has to play some zone. Agree or disagree there. I think you agree. It, he's got to mix in zone. Yes. Uh, the problem is when you're running those crossing routes, depending on where they're coming from and what you're aligned in. And if you're bringing pressure or not, you can't pass it off. You need to man up. If you're going man, you got to man, bro. That, that's the bottom line. You've got to lock up and, and take care of your responsibility at the end of the day, regardless of what they play, zone or man. you got to take care of your responsibility. The, the key is no busts in coverage. The key is to be in the spot that you're supposed to be in. And wrap up. Be there. Just yeah. don't don't allow the uh, yak. Uh, Gem0790, who would you take if Clemson and Miami make the ACC championship game? Who would you take right now, Carlos? Right now? Uh, I'm going to go Clemson. I picked Miami. I did that in my midseason uh, predictions, my oddly specific predictions. I said Miami will get the third seed and beat Clemson in the ACC championship. All right. Uh, Lowell Carr says, what is your take on why Miami has struggled recruiting wide receivers despite the number one offense in the country? Well, look, they just flipped uh, one of the best receivers in the country who was committed to the University of Florida uh this you know two weeks ago josh moore six four 205 pounder um look i think part of it uh with with receivers is you know they want to see guys get drafted i think that's a big selling point point. and if you look at miami's track record the last 20 years you've got philip dorsett you've got braxton barrios uh who else you got i don't know not a long list no, nope. uh, I think, you know, part of this and I said this on the Big O show today, part of this is getting guys drafted. You got to start having that happen here in the next few years. I think Xavier Restrepo will get drafted. I don't know that it'll be in uh, the first two days. It might be a, a day three pick, but I think somebody will, will take a chance on him the same way they did with Braxton Berrios because he's a solid football player and a productive guy, a, pro a productive slot guy. Uh, but again, those guys don't go on day one or day two. Those guys go on day three in the fourth or fifth round uh, yeah. because somebody really likes them. So they just need more of that to happen. They need they need to have a stronger track record. And uh, look, Kevin Beard, this is uh, year three back on the job. Uh, I think he's done a good job. We got JoJo Trader, missed out on Jeremiah Smith. Would have been great to get Jeremiah Smith. But why did Jeremiah Smith pick Ohio State? NFL. Yeah. Not uh, only that, but I think the uncertainty moving forward in the future a quarterback has yeah. something to do with that yeah they have a great offense this year but cam ward's gone who's going to take over cam ward so you could be coming in there and trying to catch passes from emory williams that's mm -hmm. a heck of a lot different than say catching him from uh, dj lagway or someone else that's uh dylan riola or something like that vic vassal coach vic four says do the canes have a 100 yard rusher tomorrow i think it's possible i think uh, mark fletcher could have a big day uh but i'm gonna say no i think miami's gonna uh, spread out the carries. Uh, I think Cam Ward is going to take off and run. Louisville has given up a lot of yards to opposing quarterbacks in rushing. I think this could be a day where Cam Ward uses his feet to score a couple touchdowns uh, and to and to move the change. Uh, that yeah, may... I think also you know Louisville's got a really good run defense, but uh, and their secondary is pretty bad. So I think if there's going to be a game where Cam Ward goes off, which he's done already, I think this could be the first 500 yard game that he has. Mm -hmm. uh, Louisville is 92nd in team coverage grade in the country. Uh, and 15 guys on the roster have given up. Uh, uh, let's see where do I have that stat. There's, there's uh, oh, eight guys on the roster so far have given up receptions of 30 yards or more. Eight. 
Not a good formula for them. They need a pass rush tomorrow. And, and I know Ashton Gelati's only got two sacks for the first six games, and he was a guy that everybody thought for sure. He was all ACC last year, one of the best defensive uh, pass rushers in the country. He's only got two sacks for the first six games. He will be bringing the heat, which is why it's great that Jalen Rivers is back for Miami tomorrow. Uh, all right, stop Cop City, Taco Thunder 5. How many three-loss teams make the playoff field, and who are the most likely candidates? All right, when I came out with my bracket, you can check it out at theathletic.com. I had zero three lost teams in the 12 team field. I will read it to you. This was my 12 team field. Carlos, uh, I will find it here quickly as, as fast as I can. Um, and my oddly specific predictions, you can check it out at theathletic.com. Um, I had in the first round, Texas A&M hosting 11 and two Clemson. I got Texas A&M getting to the SEC championship game after they beat Texas in the last game of the regular season. Ooh. Uh, I have a uh, 12th seed Alabama at 10 and two. Uh, they're going to lose to Tennessee this weekend. I got them playing five seed Oregon who's 12 and one Oregon will lose to Ohio state in the big uh, 10 championship game. That was my prediction. Uh, I got Penn State at 11-1. Penn State's going to lose to Ohio State, Get out, not get into the Big Ten championship game. Uh, they will host Boise State, who's 12-1, and the group of five uh, champion. I don't think Boise State loses a game. I think Ashton Gentry probably finishes as the runner-up in the Heisman to Travis Hunter. I think Cam Ward will get an invite uh, because Miami will be there uh, in the playoff. Uh, and then you have number six seed, Georgia, hosting 11 seed Tennessee, both of those teams 10 and two. I got Georgia losing to Ole Miss. I got them beating Texas this weekend, and I've got Tennessee beating Alabama this weekend, but losing, uh, I think, I don't forgot who I had them losing to later in the year, uh, but I charted it all out. I got nobody with three losses. In fact, I think the first five out teams that will not make the field are BYU 11 and two. I think they'll be the big 12 runner up because I got Ohio, uh, I'm sorry, Iowa State winning the big 12 at 12 and one. Uh, and then I've got Kansas State finishing 10 and two, not getting into the Big 12 championship game. Uh, Notre Dame finishing 10 and two, Indiana finishing 10 and two, and SMU finishing 10 and two. I think all of those teams will be the first five out. I don't think a three loss team will get in. I agree. I, but I think BYU wins the Big 12. All right. We disagreed there. Uh, Carlos, thank you for joining me uh, for our quick show Friday night. We hope you will tune in next week as we cover uh, and wrap up the Louisville game and look ahead to Florida State week, big week for Miami on the recruiting front. A lot of guys going to be coming into town. I've actually got an interview set up, Carlos, with Darion Coleman, 2026 quarterback uh, commitment for the Hurricanes. Uh, he's only a junior, but he's already committed to Miami. That's how the thing works now, Carlos. Guys commit really, really early in the process. Uh, I'm going to be talking to him couple of other guys playing in the Under Armour All-American game in the weeks ahead. So I will do a quick interview with Darian, share that on the podcast. But Carlos will be back with me to review the Louisville game and to talk about what's ahead for Florida and State. get Bears. excited for that one-win team, baby. That's right. We'll have more here on the Wide Right Pod for you to check out. But uh, thanks for coming on, Carlos, as always. Any final word? Uh, no, man. Just uh, ready to go to bed because I got to get up early. <laughs> Yeah, we've got bas you and I got basketball camp tomorrow. Yeah, yeah. We're gonna take our daughters to. So that'll exactly. be fun. All right. Yeah. All right. Thanks for tuning in to Wide Right. We'll see you next week. Peace.